Hello, Jean. Thank you so much for joining me here. Um, to those watching, my name is Cyan Costello. I work in the hunt as a archival and curatorial assistant. And Jean, if you would mind introducing yourself there. I am Jean O'Reilly, a model from the 80s in Ireland. I was a top model and now I live in America and I have a business here, a uh, very unusual business and um, that is pretty much me up to par. Brilliant, thank you. Well, to kind of go through what um, led us to meet Jean, um, in the year 2021, we at the Hunt Museum in Limerick City um, invite you to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the birth of pioneering Irish fashion designer Sybil Connolly. A year-long social media driven campaign around the life and work of the First Lady of Irish Fashion and her relationship to us at The Hunt, who hold the largest collection of her work. Each month we've taken a look at an aspect of her contribution to society, fashion, design, innovation and items at The Hunt Museum. This month we're bringing you Sybil the Person, the story of the woman behind the label. And to this end, I'm delighted to be joined by fashion model and entrepreneur Gina O'Reilly Barlow, who worked with Sybil Connolly at her atelier in Marion Square, Dublin. Jean, you're calling us from your current home in the US. Um, and thank yeah. you for introducing yourself to us here. Um, and I was wondering if you could just talk us through how you became a fashion model and how you came to know Sybil Connolly. I was uh, 18 years of age. I had just finished my leaving cert and I was ready to go to the National College of Art in Dublin. And um, a entrepreneur of the Denman Brush came to Switzers. And um, my mother said to me, I think you should go in and have your hair done. So I went in and my hair was long and he cut my hair off. And during that particular week, there was a beauty and a fashion uh, show on the late late where people of um, that world assembled and the whole show was dedicated to basically promoting fashion and beauty. So when he left obviously on Sunday we had so many calls wanting me because I was actually featured with Harold Layton of the Denman Brush on the Late Late Show. And there were people there like um, Grace O'Shaughnessy and sort of celebrities of the design and fashion world. So um, everybody went home, but the phone started to ring. And um, we uh, were sort of in a situation that I had to get myself an agent. And at the time, Grace O'Shaughnessy became my agent for a period of time. Um, within a few months, I was the Shmarnock face of vodka. I then went down to um, one a film, the film, a film a trip to the south of Italy. And that was a time then that I didn't really come back. I moved uh, throughout Italy, I modeled in Paris, London, and then when um, I needed to be able to sort of uh, rest, I would come to Ireland where I took up with photographers like, of course, my sort of favorite, Neil Campbell Sharp, who I worked with, both him and his wife for many years, Noel Campbell Sharp, Tony Higgins, Walter Pfeiffer, and it was a great time. It sounds like it, it. It sounds like a completely different world, the world of fashion, um, compared to and now. We see headlines um, about fast fashion and um, ready to wear. Um, I was wondering, could you tell us, being in Sybil's atelier, um, how would someone go through the process of ordering a dress? Well, um, then you had a situation that Sybil was a very unique person. Um, compared to people that I work with, let's say like Yusan Laurent, Junior, um, these sort of people who would design a collection and then they would have their ready to wear that would sort of follow after the collection. So with Sybil, she was, uh, she had a very 
selective and prestige clientele. And so, you know, it would be very much her creations would be designed for the person. So, you know, that was all a very sort of personalized, you know, um, situation that was pretty unique. Sybil was unique in herself, in her own way. So we had, um, obviously, the superstars who used to come in. She uh, designed the inauguration gown for Jacqueline Kennedy. Uh, her close friend, Eleanor Lambert, um, the famous publicist in New York, would actually host Sybil in New York three times a year in her apartment. So it was a very much a networking among, you know, the sort of very important people of her world. And we did not have the internet, but she was still able to basically become, you know, a world renowned figure in both the fashion and her decorative world, just via networking. She was a very nice person. You were, yeah, you've attested her um, niceness to part of the reason of her success. And it is amazing um, that an Irish designer in that age, as you say, an age before internet, um, us on a little island of her own, managed to compete with designers out in Europe, um, such as Dior, Yves Saint Laurent. Um, but I think a big part of it as well is that kind of um, craftsmanship that she put into each piece. I'm seeing that you're wearing one of her pieces there. If you could tell this us is, a little bit about it. Um, this is, um, she had, um, I think, uh, her, her sort of faves, especially in the uh, fashion world. Of course, you know, her pleated linen was um, sort of a signature of hers which she um, made these great ball gowns and skirts from. The pleated linen was um, made in Belfast, in a factory in Belfast, and this was very uniquely her hers. Um, I mean, she was up there with people like Fortuny, who was also famous for his pleated silk. And um, then you had, you know, Irish hands, which was her time that she explored the crafts people in Ireland. And she drew from people like, you know, the lace makers in their home. And she then incorporated the lace making into her um, designs. And hence, this is one of her famous um, tops made from carried McCross hand made lace. She, um, I have in my um, home in Ireland, um, just spectacular dress. Uh, dresses, one of which would do the Oscars proud. I don't think you could outdo it. It was a dress made from pure gold and um, thread. And, um, you know, she was, she was limitless in her conception of what she wanted to do. She was inspired very much, you know, with nature, with flowers. And, you know, she would, she loved just, you know, what she could see in front of her. Her garden gave her a great pleasure. Um, she also compiled uh, The Irish Garden, um, which was another book she did. But um, anyway, so I could go on, but I will let <laughs> Well, I'm just curious, since you have actually had first-hand experience um, with the woman herself, what was your overall impression of her? What was my overall impression? My overall impression um, was, we were just talking about this um, the last few days. Um, she, and obviously I was um, talking to um, her good friend uh, and someone who helped her for many years, um, Jane Sheridan. Um, she was an extremely nice person. And I think this was probably one of the keys of her success. She was herself. She never tried to be anybody else. And, um, you know, from the start, she, you know, if you go back to the 50s and the 60s in Ireland, she was a single woman. She never got married. Um, she did what she did. She had a belief in herself. She didn't have to lean on anybody. She believed that what she could do would get her you know, to the place of, you know, 
just being able to expose herself and her designs and what she believed in by being just herself and a very nice person. She didn't bamboozle anybody. She didn't have to be that sort of force. She didn't have to be, you know, in any way derogatory. She was always such a calm, pleasant person to be around. And I think this was probably the key of her success. This is why people loved her. People like John Loring of Tiffany's. He was the design director of Tiffany's. You know, just loved being around her. She exuded this artistic uh, talent, but she was also such a refreshing person just to be with. And um, people would come and stay constantly at the news, which was her sort of um, place that people stayed. People like Nancy Lancaster, who was, of course, you know, the sort of equivalent of Sybil in England. She was um, the, the design director of Colfax and Fowler, which is still, you know, there today. And um, they would have been very good friends. So they would have been able to collaborate and talk about, you know, a time where they're not alone except the fashion world. Um, the, but she also then, after the fashion, she sort of migrated into the design world. And this she brought even the pre pleated linen, which was, as I said earlier, her signature, uh, you know, one of her signature sort of styles. She then started decorating the walls with the pleated linen. And, you know, she um, believed in herself to a point that that's what I think inspired me. That's her stamp she left on me. She said, you know, you can do anything that you mind to. So, you know, when I arrived in the US, um, I had, uh, I, I went home to help look after my parents. I was a Sotheby's associate and I would go and I would pick up fragment artifacts in Europe, in Italy and in France. And um, I would then bring them back. My daughters were small and I would decorate them. Very, no one was doing it. Very unusual uh, sort of thing to actually put your hand to. But this was what Sybil imparted into me, that you could do anything that your heart's desire, that you were talented, that you had a creative urge to do. And I think that's what, if she had a legacy, that's what she passed on to me. And I think that's what people should really know her for, that she inspired, she said, you can do whatever you set your mind to. And, you know, she didn't define, you know, um, people or places. Yeah, she seems to have had um, such an impact on Irish fashion. I mean, personally, yourself, she seems to have inspired your business um, and even your attitude um, towards business and towards um, fine art and, and design. Um, so I was curious, what was your own kind of personal experience of being in Marion Square as a model at that time? Um, we would love to, um of course, visit Marion Square because um, there was so much um, pomp and ceremony, but also, you know, when we were, um, let's say, when Sybil would have a showing, she, as I said, would be in the drawing room, we would be in the dining room behind, the clothes would be brought up from the workroom on the rails, and um, we would be served afternoon tea in China cups from a silver teapot. Uh, <laughs> we would have our cucumber sandwiches. I mean, there was, you know, so much elegance and style, even, you know, among us in like when we were just getting in and out of the clothes. Um, Sybil would then, uh, as we would pass through the uh, folding doors, then it was very personal, it was very one-on-one. -on -one. She would then explain the garment and what she actually, uh, you know, thought the creative part. This was her way of selling. It was an inspiration that came that by the time she had finished explaining what this was all about, you were captivated. You were brought into the whole world of Sybil. 
Um, you have to remember that everything she had around her was also, you know, pretty much touched by her. And um, I mean, just everything. I mean, I just have here is one of our plate holders. This is uh, one of our plates from her personal house, but just even a plate holder. It was all wrapped in velvet. I mean, no matter what she did was sort of excellent. So, you know, people were enthralled, I think, with just, you know, her presence. And I'm, I, I think what I remember most, there was a great sense of calm. There was a peace. There was no hustle and bustle. So from someone who probably, you know, um, a client, let's say the, their clients, we have Lady Ivy, or we had um, uh, Lady Bike from Rossborough House, uh, Lady Dunsany. These were the clients that would come in, her Irish clientele. It was very personal, personable. It was very relaxed. And you entered into her home. We, the models that were there, um, were, you know, it, it was a very personal experience. It wasn't just something that was, let's say, when I, you know, did the collections in Paris, it was very cut and dry. It was, you were in there, it was, you were on a mission, and um, there was no sort of, um, it, it, it was a different world. Definitely. It, I mean, fashion seems to have evolved I don't know for better or for worse um in recent years I don't know if you've been kind of keeping your toe in with um Irish fashion or with contemporary fashion at the minute but I was just curious what your opinion opinion was on um the fashion coming out of Ireland in recent years since those Marion Square days um well again I'm an innovator I'm a creator so I'm more sort of apt to follow people who um, have sort of similar characteristics. And of course, my one of my favorite, of course, was John Russia. Um, John and myself, you know, went back to the time when we were in our early 20s. And, you know, we would be in my little red sports car in London and we would set up in uh, Ireland House. I mean, you have to remember, we were very young, but we were out there and we were doing it. And um, then John, you know, um, made very much a statement for himself in both Ireland and, of course, in England. And, you know, even John, of course, went out and then started to design for Waterford Glass. So there was a spillover from this world into the decorative world because that was just how they progressed. His daughter would, would probably even be my most favorite uh, designer right now she um does not she, she do, she's not defined by borders and i think she got this artistic gene from her father i know that when i was um getting married the first time um i said to john john i need a wedding dress and he designed me a dress i never saw the dress i had no idea what it was like until he gave it to me brought it to the Burlington Hotel and he said, here's your dress. It was in a bag that was good enough for me. And um, he was just an artist. He, and I think Odette, I love the way she has got that sort of freedom, which I'm sure she inherited from John. So my fave would be definitely, you know, Simon. Yes, yeah, I, I completely agree there as well myself, I'm a huge fan. Um, and, and just to see how they borrow from Irish culture, the same as Sybil has done, as you're wearing the carpet cross lace and it references um, flowers from Sybil's childhood as well as her own garden. Um, you showed us there her um, dish rack or, or plate rack, I should say, and you actually have quite an extensive collection of Sybil's items. And I was wondering if you could talk us through a few of them there. Sure. Um, we have here, okay, um, one of the most, I think, her favourite flower was Lily of the Valley. And this, this is the original painting. Um, it's a um, oil, it's a, um, one of the ones that she had in her book here. The book is in an Irish house. This is the actual 
picture of the um, painting. And from that, you know, um, one of her, you know, uh, signature Irish garden by Sybil Connolly by Sigma. And here she is, the Lily of the Valley. And um, this was a setting she did with each an individual setting of a different flower type. And um, we also have here her famous Marion Square for Tiffany's. This was um, inspired by um, uh, the flower painter. And um, this was uh, one of the most popular of uh, Tiffany's patterns um, belonging to Sybil. Her Irish hands would have been, of course, Nicholas Moss um, for his famous sponge wear. But Sybil would have had a twist on it. She collaborated with Nicholas Moss. Hence, we have the unusual handle here, which was, I believe, you know, probably Sybil's input with it. And this also was a private line that left Nicholas Moss inspired by Sybil that was sold via Sybil through Tiffany's. Um, then we have here, would you like to come with me? And we will show you briefly here. This was, um, this is the famous mirror. And um, this is one of our favorite pieces. It is an 18th century Italian mirror. And this was in her own living room here. And it is um, just a very beautiful mirror in its own right. Here we have it in another book. Here is how they decorate it. And we will then go through here. This was perhaps one of her favorite pieces too. It was a French bird cage, which um, I have uh, my pieces in. She did pretty much exactly the same. She was able to put uh, her fashion creations into this. And it was in, again, her hallway in Marion Square. And she would dress her models in this huge bird cage. So um, these are, are just a couple of pieces. I have a lot of Sybil's pieces, which um, have been um, just, I guess, special to me. Um, and, um, you know, uh, I think even to this day, you know, her pieces speak. I can definitely get that from a especially the furniture that was in Marion Square and in the Muse, um, the, the memories that those items must have of walls at the top. I've seen images of Marion Square, the inside of the atelier. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk about how working with Sybil compared with working with other designers at the time. Um, well, again, when you entered into Sybil's world, you entered into a place, as you just said a minute ago, um, her house from which she lived and worked. She lived upstairs. Um, she was an early riser. She would get up at five in the morning and she that was when most of her creative work was done. Um, but the house um, spilled over, you know, into her sort of um, design genius. Um, you know, her clothes were part of that, but I think she was multifaceted in basically how, you know, as, as an artist, I mean, you, I understand that you go from, you know, one thing and then, you know, the sort of, you, you, you need to go forward and you need to um, explore different routes. So I think this is what happened. This is the progression from the fashion into the design and hence she met people like as i said you know nancy lancaster who they would you know have been great sort of friends but comparing to my, me when i modeled in london and paris it was much more of a rap race and um, you know um people like you know um let's say carl lagerfield or Jean Muir or of course Kenzo, you know, it was much more manufactured. They were large companies. They were, there was a, it was a company that was out to make money. Sybil did it effortlessly. She wasn't under the pressure 
she didn't have co a corporation that she had to feed in so far as hers was just sort of a natural spillover of her um, creative um, genius. Yeah, it was her own home that you were welcomed into, which I'm sure the clients um, got great satisfaction out of being that close to the designer and her own life. And the, as you say, she had such exalted um, clients as well. I was wondering, were you ever in contact with such people? Um, the, the people that we hear of, like, you know, Elizabeth Taylor and, you know, um, Jacqueline Anassas and so on and so forth, um, they were, th that would have been a whole setup unto itself. She was very private about, you know, who she actually designed for. And, um, you know, we would arrive or I would arrive and I would never know who was going to be there. And it was all very unassuming. She treated people very much, you know, on her, like there was an equality there. Um, you know, she was someone who, I think that's what sp spoke to people that they felt, you know, very much at home in her home because she was not um, impressed no matter who was in front of her. She was just civil. And I think, you know, that's what really summed her up as being, I think in one of her books, Jane said, you know, her, obviously her butler and her right hand man. Sybil was a very nice person and she retorted, but he was also a very nice person. So that would have been very much, you know, how she sort of saw people. It would be so interesting for her and to hear what she has to say about the fashion industry now because I think it has changed. I have my own daughter has modeled and is modeling in Milan. And, you know, she is very much um, part and parcel with what's going on right now. And it is different. It is, you know, because of the internet and because of fashion influencers and because of basically how people market themselves. Um, there is, it, it's like a, a whole generation, it's like a world of difference between now and then. But even then, um, she was definitely a woman in her own right and someone who did things not as the normal would do. You seem to take a huge amount of inspiration from Sybil in how, you know, she pioneered herself. And as you say, she did not need some sort of corporation behind her to back her up. It was, it was all her own work. Um, how how has that carried through for you in your in your own life in your own business? Well, um, she did, as I said earlier, she did something which she believed in. Um, I um, took broken artifacts, Italian pieces. Um, a lot of them are were from um, broken pieces in Italian churches. They've gone beyond restoration. Uh, but I didn't see them as being discarded pieces. I saw them pieces that could be recreated. And you know, um, then uh, what I did was I didn't try and um, restore. I basically, you know, took something and made it a sculpture form, making it, um, I, I gave it a new life. And, you know, I sort of went with what I believed you know, was a very unusual concept, which um, my pieces have been copied, you know, in China, all over the world, and have been sold. And um, I do a sort of a one of a kind right now. And um, we have um, sold, at least we have, um, we are in the Smithsonian, we sell in museums all over Europe, but um, my pieces, I think, um, come from what I, something that I see in my, what I see and create out of myself. And I think that's what Sybil, what I got from Sybil, to follow your dreams, to follow something which maybe no one else has done before, but don't be limited by either, you know, your sort of lack of education. I came from a modeling background. What I did was I had no training in, but I loved what I do. I loved going to Paris 
going to Italy, these old rags that I used to model in, and going to, you know, the antique fairs or the flea markets and picking up, you know, these discarded 17th and 18th century pieces, and then bringing them back to the US. And I live at the close of the, uh, I live at the base, I should say, close to the Great Smoky Mountains and um, the Cherokee Indians. And they are famous for their minerals, rubies, emeralds, mica. Um, it is probably the feast of where, you know, uh, natural forming minerals come from. So I was able to take the best of the minerals and decorate my pieces. And, you know, that is something which I think I love doing most of all. And I could honestly equate that with Sybil. She was at her best when she was in a flow of creating. And, you know, I get that, but I didn't get it until I started doing what I'm doing now. And that's what I think, as I said to you pre previously, if I can give anybody, you know, something of Sybil, that, you know, in the artistic world, especially now, you know, we are told, for example, I have um, schools and uh, educational institutions that bring me in and they say, can you tell people that, you know, if they have an artistic ability to go with it, don't think that they've got to have an academic or they've got to have a university or they've got, they, they, they are not to be limited to basically the world system. They are to go with what they believe in, and that is what is going to make them successful, not be defined by man or culture. Well, Jean, I think that's very inspirational. I thank you so much for um, chatting to me today. It's been so lovely to get to know you and your collection of Sybil's artifacts. I'm just overawed by your anecdotes about the woman herself, and it's just so wonderful after doing the research for so long to meet someone with real life stories, real life experience of Sybil and the fashion industry at that time. So thank you so much, Jean, um, for joining wow. us today. So thank you, everyone. Um, that is our interview with Jean O'Reilly Barlow, international superstar, model and um, entrepreneur. So thank you so much, Jean. And that's goodbye for me at Cyan, the Hunt Museum.